So we're really lucky to have you here, Chris. Thanks so much for, for talking to me today. No, thanks for having us, and thank you, Jason. All right, so uh, as a tiny bit of background, you started uh, eLoan in 96, and uh, went public in 99. Um, Prosper came in 2004, and most recently Ripple, which you started in 2012. So eLoan and, and, and Prosper were all about lending, right? So you have these two very interesting, very successful companies, and then you suddenly just decide to go into blockchain. So what was that about? Well, it's uh, an incredibly exciting time right now in blockchain. We really think this is a fundamental game change within financial services. And, and part of, you know, the, there was some frustration in Elon and Prosper in that those things could never be global, uh, you know, financial services companies like all the tech companies could be. And kind of the missing ingredient was that there really wasn't an infrastructure for value to move around the world in the way that we have an infrastructure for data to move around the world. So we've had this Cambrian explosion of, of tech companies, obviously the internet, which has been incredible, but fintechs not, hasn't really seen that. You know, Elon Prosper were in the US, you could do another version in Japan or in Germany or whatever, but nothing interoperated. And what's so exciting about blockchain and what we're trying to do with Ripple is that now you have, uh, it, it, and it's already started, it's unstoppable, um, financial networks anywhere in the world can interoperate with any other financial network. So it's not just about digital assets, that's one component, but uh, as importantly, it's moving anything of value. Chinese RMB, Euro, dollar, um, moving that instantly, basically frictionless with access to everyone. So I think what's gonna happen is a, a Cambrian explosion in FinTech uh, is coming. And that's really exciting. Okay. So we've seen a huge explosion uh, in funding or, or funding moving around the blockchain space, certainly on the, the back of cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, the daddy of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, uh, appreciating so massively in value, also Ethereum. Um, I'm curious, like, as a founder, where do you think funding should be coming from for those companies who want to make their way in, in the blockchain space? Yeah, it's been a really interesting year, obviously, with, uh, you know, the explosion of digital assets uh, has been incredible. Uh, you know, we're looking at uh, several uh, of these digital assets, including XRP, or in the tens of billions now. So that's incredible, and it's a worldwide phenomenon. And there's a real use case. These are things, are, uh, things of, uh, digital things of value without a counterpart. That's really interesting. At the same time, there's been some troubling things happening this year, and specifically with this notion of initial coin offerings. And I know these are getting a lot of excitement. I mean, it's intoxicating for founders to think about, you know, companies raising a quarter billion dollars on a white paper with a team of, you know, under 10. I mean, that's what's going on in the last couple months. But it's incredibly uh, scary and unfortunate. I think it's, it's, it's scary for people that are uh, getting into some of these ICOs, whether you call them investments, donations, whatever. But I think impor as importantly, it's scary for any entrepreneur thinking about using them. Um, it, this is the Wild West. Uh, you're talking about uh, too much too soon with regulators all around the world now circling, rightly so. I mean, we would advocate more regulation, you know, kind of regulatorily, uh, regulatory enabled innovation is a good thing. But for an entrepreneur now, I think they should stay away from these ICOs because this could come back to haunt you in two years, five years. Strict liability with securities laws are brutal. Um, and we're in an environment where you can, if you have a good idea, you can raise money. There's, there's never been better, you know, more ways to raise money without having that hanging over your head for the next decade. So that, that's kind of what, what we would say about that. So there's an often sort of maybe even a cliche around blockchain. Um, this is the technology with the power to disrupt the financial system as we know it. Um, you know, I, I, can, I guess we're probably all a bit curious to know what your experience has been like with Ripple, how banks have actually reacted to you, and what kind of pushback you've seen from institutions. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very interesting industry where you have both kind of ultra-libertarians trying to blow up the world's financial system and kill the banks and all that, and that's certainly where it started. But at the same time now, what we're seeing, I, I've never seen more opportunity to serve the banks, work with the banks. I mean, we're, we're entirely enterprise focused. Banks are our main customer. We have about 100 banks that we work with all around the world. 
And I th so I think uh, you can come at this a lot of different ways. I would say, you know, don't mix politics and technology. Um, and so kind of this libertarian streak, uh, applying that to a product offering, I think that's uh, frankly a recipe for failure. Um, and, you know, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to impact the world in a positive way. You're going to have greater impact by working with the banks. All the banks in the world now, they know the systems of moving value cross-border are antiquated. It doesn't work in, in, a, in a world where you have apps that you know, work with billions of people instantly. So every bank in the world knows we need to be able to move value like information. Um, I think everybody understands this is the missing link in globalization. You know, we have interoperability in data and, and, and shipping goods, but not in money. And, and that's absolutely key to get right. Um, so you can make a huge impact on the world. You can be incredibly successful by working with uh, the banks and the incumbents. And, and particularly in finance where, you know, this is about bringing three really difficult domains, uh, tech, compliance, and capital together. You could argue banks are actually pretty good at that. So this might be different than the internet where, you know, a couple people in a garage can just code away and kill the world. Um, it's as likely that a bank is going to have one of these brand new services because they, they get how to integrate those three domains better than maybe somebody else. You touched on an interesting point just then. I mean, the, the blockchain space is, is full of kind of, of, of visionaries and, and, and libertarians as, as well as very pragmatic people um, and, and people who, with a very technical focus. I kind of, I wonder how you see yourself within that space uh, as someone who was very much a, a pioneer of this technology, but I mean, do you, how do you feel that you fit in with, with the rest of the, the gangs? I'm a, I'm a reform disruptor. So, I mean, I, hey, look, I used to be out there pitching, we're gonna kill the banks with the loan, and pro I did that. Um, and I see the error of my ways. Um, and it's just hard. I mean, you know, uh, if you wanna go direct to consumer, you might turn around one day and realize your entire company is, is marketing and customer support, and it's like 5% tech. And that's a recipe for failure, too. Right now, we're about two-thirds tech because we're, we're in, the, in the plumbing of the financial system. Um, we don't have to market to consumers. Uh, and that way, we can attract a bigger tech team. And, you know, the best tech people want to work with great tech teams, and that means big tech teams. So I think we can have more impact. So we, and, and especially if you're trying to serve Chinese banks, Japanese banks, German banks, Australian banks, you cannot have any politics in this. Um, you, know, you can't be thumbing your nose at China's capital controls. You, you should be trying to help China uh, market the, the RMB in Latin America um, and whatever they want. So you have, I think you have to take a very agnostic view and just be be builders, not disruptors. I think that would be the, the main thing I would say. And I, I hope we, we're seen that way. So uh, in this world of building, not disrupting, um, where lots of people have kind of thrown out traditional company models almost, they've thrown out some traditional ways of raising money, do you think a decentralized company can work? How do you see that playing out? I'm generally not a fan of these decentralized models, and there's a lot of them in blockchain where there is no main place to gather, everybody works in front of a computer screen in you know, 20 different countries. That can work in small groups, and maybe even in some, like our C++ team is pretty well decentralized. That just works in that, in that group. But companies are about culture, they're about core values, they're about um, seeing each other, uh, you know, throwing things around. So I'm, I'm down on decentralized corporate structures. Frankly, I think that's why the Bay Area is, you know, tripling down. Um, people try to replicate Silicon Valley, but it just, it's getting bigger and stronger all the time. I mean, you have to be, we have offices in seven other locations, but we have our core here just because I think you get better results if people are, can work together in, a, in, a, in an organization. On the subject of concentration uh, within blockchain, um, I'm, I'm curious how you, how comfortable you are with with companies and inventors sitting on massive pools of their own assets. 
do you think this this provides the stability uh, that, that can make us feel kind of comfortable with the idea of these things going forward when they're not highly regulated, but they are in control of really big pools of assets, you know, an anonymous Satoshi or, you know, a, a company with a, a big hefty chunk of their own assets? Yeah, as, as long as uh, these digital assets are based on decentralized ledgers, decentralized financial technology, uh, that's a necessity, so you don't have a counterparty, and that's why these assets are so interesting and so unusual. Um, but I think it does help for the long-term vision to be very well resourced. We have about 170 people in our company. Uh, we do uh, hold tens of billions of dollars in, in digital assets. And, you know, frankly, we, I'm, I was really um, interested in something Jeff Bezos said recently on how he looks at his company. He says, you know, lots of companies look three years in the future. Um, and he says, that's a crowded space. Everybody's planning for three years. Um, he looks seven years in the future. And that is, there's not a lot of competition there. And, but to do that, you have to have founder control. You have to have some, somebody controlling the vision who can, you know, frankly, stare down their investors, their board, and make the case that, nope, we need to stick with this for the long haul. That's really hard to do when founders don't have control. So I'd say, if you're a founder, maintain control at all costs. And then also have as a big a balance sheet as you can. Have as much resource as you can so you can you know, be successful like an Amazon and get through the winters and get through the deserts uh, that are always, always going to be there. Um, these are good times now, but that could change in an instant. And having lots of resources is, is really helpful to having impact. So I've had a couple of conversations with people where you know, we, we want to have some sort of expert opinion uh, on a blockchain matter. And often we find ourselves running into this, this, uh, this, uh, this, to this end point where we're like, well, actually, kind of no one knows this. <laughs> There's no one to be the, the kind of arbiter or the expert on something that's such a new technology. Um, and as someone who, who was running a company where you needed a whole lot of blockchain, blockchain experts, uh, and, and knowing that, that we've had a couple of panels where, with some eye-watering salary figures for uh, all artificial intelligence engineers, how much uh, should we be willing to pay uh, a really good blockchain engineer? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I think everybody, uh, most people in tech, they do want the upside. And again, that's one of the tremendous advantages that these startups have, is they have this huge upside if they, if they make the right bets. So certainly, uh, you know, incenting with the usual stock options. Incenting with digital assets is tricky uh, because there's a really complex tax rules and it's uncharted territory. Um, so I would encourage you to try to do it. I'd say be really careful with the tax uh, issues uh, because that can hurt the employee if you do that the wrong way. Um, but certainly uh, for great people, you know, like they always say, if, uh, one great engineer, uh, one great expert, uh, easily worth 10 uh, good, you know, engineers or, or, or good professionals and paying up. Uh, you sort of have to do that given what's going on around here and, and throughout the world. But I'd say with the, with the right upside and with the right kind of vision for impact, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always heartening to hear how many really great people are looking for you know, how, how is how's this going to be positive for the world? And you can successfully recruit against some of the best resource companies in the world with a, with a, a, a good explanation of how you're going to impact the world in a positive way. Is it the kind of salaries to tempt them away from Wall Street? Or, uh, the, I mean, we could talk in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions? Uh, you know, it's, I, I'd still say the salaries Salaries are, are reasonable compared to what you see on Wall Street. Because again, people aren't looking for that kind of this year's bonus. They're looking for the big win. So, uh, you know, it, it, things are expensive, but they're not, I think they're not crazy expensive like other domains that we, we see out there. Okay. Um, so we're going to have to wrap up pretty soon, but just quickly, um, you're a very pragmatic person, I think, and, and, and have approached the blockchain space um, in that way. Do you think blockchain needs as many evangelists as it has at the moment? Well, uh, yes, I think it's exciting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am seeing this kind of libertarian blow up the world thing is fading out. 
And there's kind of another group who's recognizing this as an internet of value. And every evangelist in the internet, you know, I mean, we needed those people. And they helped convince other smart people and capital to flow in. Um, I would just say it's a change in, in what that ev you're evangelizing for. Evangelizing for an internet of value that includes everybody, that's very inclusive, uh, that's very positive. I think where we get into trouble is we, we try to we try to be too elite and we try to, uh, you know, talk about how everybody's dumb and, you know, banks are stupid and with no appreciation for how hard it is to reconcile the world we live in today. It's very hard. Um, there are really smart people out there. So kind of we're all in this together, I think, is, is a good way of thinking about it. Thanks, Chris. I think that's our time. Thank you. Okay.